Here in Los Angeles, we have a great new art scene in downtown Los Angeles around 5th and Main. I bet you're surprised about that. The group has been there for less than a year and there are already 16 galleries and they are just jumping. So today, my guest is Adam Gross, who has a wonderful gallery downtown and loves to talk about art. It's a foundation. Is it a grant? It's a nonprofit organization. It's called Pharmaca, and um, I should correct you because it's not my gallery. It is a nonprofit. I happen to be on the board of the nonprofit, um, but we're doing a lot of exciting things both in the gallery and in the downtown art scene. Um, there's just so much going well, on. Well, let's Molly. get started with you, Please. Adam. How, <laughs> how did it all start? Um, you were weren't you at Butterfields for a while? I was at Butterfields when it was owned by eBay, which was quite a challenge. Um, you know, why? The, well, a challenge in that. You have a very uh, the auction business, you know, as first started by Mr. Christie's in uh, or Mr. Christie in what the 18th century is a very traditional business. It has its own rhythm. Um, you want to you want to handle the objects that you are handling with the respect that they deserve. Why do you think people buy at auctions? Um, the excitement of it, the potential for that deal or yeah, to, to yeah. discover that little something that, uh, you know, the double-sided Picasso or the, uh, you know, there's, there's I, I have friends and clients that are obsessive junk buyers and it, it blows me away because very often they come back from some consignment house or some estate sale somewhere and they have found something that might not be the million dollar piece, but it's certainly worth more than the $50 that they spent on it. And there's, there's an excitement to that. And I, I think that that excitement, I would like to see that excitement um, more turn towards the contemporary art scene because I think that that same sense of discovery can be there and I think ultimately it's more than just the, um, the, the, the rush of, ex of discovery and thinking I outsmarted somebody, look I, I spent $50 and it's worth $5,000, yeah. it becomes a much more personal endeavor. Um, but the, the conflict really with Butterfields and eBay was you were going from a very traditional auction house and auction situation. It's been there two or three hundred years, yeah. Certainly, and all of a sudden uh, merging that with the eBay idea, which was, um, you know, it's really not so much what you're selling, it's just how much of it are you selling. And uh, there, was a, there was a lot of tension there because of it. But, um, you know, I think that everyone handled themselves well and, and uh, I don't know if it was the best move for eBay ultimately because eBay doesn't like to handle things. They, they like you to handle the thing. And um, Butterfield somehow became their art handlers in, in a sense. But it was, it was a great so experience So did it break overall. up? The group break up? The, well, no, um, it, uh, eBay eventually sold Butterfields to Bonhams now, creating the, I think, the third largest auction house in the world. And uh, they're doing very well because of it now, because they've focused on what their strengths are, and they aren't worried about weekly auctions on online. It's One of the things I noticed about auctions is that there's great competition. People really love to show off and mm -hmm. buy art for their, you know, mm -hmm. for their family. But uh, it's, it's just amazing for me to watch because a husband and wife will split up and then they'll compete over, you mm -hmm. know, who can get a certain piece of art. So mm -hmm. that sort of plays in where we don't see that in galleries, you know? No, I mean, certainly in a gallery, you might be able to, um, to, to play that a little bit. And, yeah. uh, you know, oftentimes uh, if you have a piece on hold and suddenly for somebody else, suddenly that's the exact piece that the other person wants. But I mean, you know, in a gallery situation, there's, there, it seems like in every show, there's one painting that if you had 50 of the same painting, you could have sold them all because um, there's, there's always that one piece that seems What do you to, think that's the best one? Well, I don't know if it's the best one, the but it might just- system of agreements that that's the best? Well, it's just, um, there's usually in any body of work, 
in any, in any artist or group of artists, there is going to be um, one piece or maybe a couple of pieces that will be especially nice and especially emblematic of their work. And, uh, you know, I liken it to Picasso, who was an extremely prolific artist. And, you know, he didn't crank out a masterpiece a day. He had a couple of really great paintings, a lot of excellent paintings, and then, you know, a lot where he was just trying to figure it out. And um, I think that also is a hallmark of a, a great artist where they're able to to a certain extent, um, explore their ideas for you, to, to bring you as a viewer into that process. And um, that to me is, is the most exciting thing about contemporary art. Is so in your career, connection. you started there and then what happened? Well, actually, I, I were started- Were you from Los Angeles from or were you from New York? From Los Angeles originally. Um, never thought I'd end up back here. I'd spent a lot of time in Europe and Paris um, and also in New York, but uh, family issues sort of conspired to bring me back here. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, I had a family and now here's my home and uh, I'm happy for it. I mean, it's a wonderful city. And there's also a sense of, um, LA is a, LA's very much a meritocracy. You know, LA is a place where uh, the, the memories are not very long and histories can be created somehow. But um, back to your original question, my, I started in the art world actually studying finance at UCLA. I took a art history class and went from being like, you know, the guy in the back of the class that really didn't care to being in Up the in front the row, row yeah. you know, raising my hand. And I, I know this, this is great. And, and for me, art history, what excited me about art history was it was like something tangible that you could see history through, that like you could know what these people were thinking by how they painted it. You could know what, how they traded with other cultures by the materials they were using. And that to me was so inspiring. And, and I, I don't know how that converted into contemporary art, but um, I think that ultimately it was those relationships with the artists and watching them create that became Just so Just to rewarding. sideline, if gold isn't the, the uh, trade, what would be a trade? Like Seychell, seashells? Oh, well, you know, meaning like um, if you had, uh, you know, if you look at pre-Columbian art and you would see um, turquoise in the, which was very revered by the Mayans and the Aztecs. Um, you know, if you see turquoise all of a sudden showing up in Aztec jewelry or in Mayan jewelry, and then you know that they don't have it locally, so that's coming from, uh, you know, the American Southwest and it's the Hopi Indians. And then, you know, suddenly you're able to learn so much about a culture by these very simple little things, um, and it's uh, what would be the word for it? It's like um, it's like detective work almost, and yeah, and that was yeah. that was a challenge of it. And I really liked uh, the idea of, of looking at other cultures and understanding in that way. But um, but once again, you know, contemporary art just offers its own discovery process, and it's its own language. Well, and it's also it's alive. You know, yeah, it's not yeah. I, you're not. And that was the thing that ultimately got me about um, about art history was that I, I felt like you know what I felt like. Molly, I felt like I was picking over the cadaver left by the art establishment. I, I, that I was left with, you know, the press releases and the catalogs and the museum shows and the gallery shows, and that was really all I could see. And, you know, the, every once in a while you hear, I mean, the, the classic example is uh, Vincent Van Gogh, you know, a guy who toiled just selflessly for his whole life selling what one painting in his entire life and finally 50 years later he's discovered by the art establishment and then from that point on there's you know tomes written about him and movies made but you know during his life and afterwards he was nobody um, even though he was somebody and that's where the contemporary art scene I think offers a great value in that you can go out and discover things on your own that are important to you and where it's not so much, what's the resale value on this? And, uh, you know, um, will people recognize this as a Picasso when they see it on my wall? So. Tell me about, didn't you work with Niels? Yeah, I worked with the, can the Niels Cantor and the Cantor family for, um, for some time. And that was, that was an interesting experience. I, actually, I could credit Niels with my love for contemporary art because it was through, um, it was through Paul, through stories that Paul Cantor was telling about, you know, showing uh, Richard Diebenkorn, discovering Richard Diebenkorn at um, Georgia O'Keeffe's house in Taos, you know, and showing him when nobody cared in 1950 where he couldn't sell one drawing for fifty dollars. Um, th those stories really made it alive. And then Ulrika. Niels' mother um, being very active in the 70s and 80s in the art scene in Los Angeles. Well, this is so funny you bring this up because when I first got into the art world in the late 60s, I worked with the father. Mm -hmm, with Paul, right. And then uh, Erika and I were rivals. Mm -hmm. We were next door to each other on La Cienega. La Cienega. Right. 
and um, we were always rivaling over who would get what artist, mm -hmm. and then uh, we would who would get what sale. And then now Niels is he was at one point across from the PDC. Now he's taken that old space of zero one. Yes, yes, and he's actually recently. Um, I'm very excited for him because he's recently set up a partnership with. I think it's. Uh, it's Mr. Foyer, we'll just say. I think it's Matt Foyer, if I'm not mistaken, who has a gallery. It's either in New York or in Brooklyn. And I'm very excited for Niels in that um, because it'll, uh, I, I think that the, the relationship between New York and Los Angeles is one that is not recognized uh, people talk about the competition between them, especially as art centers um, or even just as media centers. But uh, I think that there's a lot of cooperation that goes on oh, there absolutely. that doesn't get. I just feel showcased. that in New York, the artists are the stars where and the museums and the uh, magazines are, are there. But here, I think movie stars and TV stars still rule the roost. So art is like a second uh, that's an interesting observation because the, the, the stardom that you have in New York seems to be, you know, it's, the, uh, it's Sandy Weil, it's Citibank, it's Donald Trump, who has become a star in his own right. But um, these are people who are stars because of what they have done and what they have created. Yeah, and, for, and it's yeah. not so much about their public image or their personality. And in Los Angeles, it is so much about that public image and personality. But, you know, something that I always, uh, I always marvel at are a couple of things in regards to the LA New York relationship is you know if you look through any art magazine and look who's showing in New York a good 20 to 30 percent of the people that are in those shows are oftentimes Los Angeles yeah, artists exactly. or working in Los Angeles and secondly the thing that always kind of gives me some chagrin is when when I have clients who see, who I might show something in Los Angeles and then it, for one reason or another, it ends up in New York, and, and of course they end up going to New York to make the purchase and, and spending more money but they feel okay about it because they're buying it in New York. Somehow that confers a sense of When I value. opened my first gallery in 67, I had been a New Yorker and I spent a lot of time uh, showing second generation abstract expressions like Ray Parker, mm -hmm. Jack Youngerman, mm -hmm. Frank Roth, and people would come and see my shows and then go to New York and buy from the established galleries. Right. They thought and my gallery was cute. And it's frustrating as all hell, yeah. you know, because you're, because I, 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 and I think, because it's like you're doing the brave thing. Um, you're the one that's actually out there in an environment which might not be so receptive to contemporary art and actually laying it out on the line. And I mean, you know how it feels when you have a show and nobody buys anything. And then, like you said, six months later, all of a sudden the show sells out in New York. Exactly. And you're like, what did, what, what what did, did I, I do, do wrong? wrong? Um, but that's something that, that, that's something that I am... The pro one problem that I see with the art world is that it is very, there's a lot of attitude that goes on in it, and especially in very established galleries. You know, uh, you can't have a price list because you're not a client of mine, or w whatever the attitude is going to be. And I find that a lot of people go into galleries and feel intimidated. Totally. Um, and uh, I mean, my rule is, is if, if you have the, if you have the desire and the, 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 if you have the desire to come into a gallery, which is already a brave thing, and, and take a moment to look. And if you actually can muster up a question for me, or even not even a question, I will come up and, and talk to you because I think that you deserve my time. And I don't care if you're wearing flip-flops or, you know, Harry Winston. It really doesn't matter because... We used to be able to tell if uh, somebody could buy art by the shoes. You know, I... Um, I don't pr prescribe by that because I will never forget one day when I was working <laughs> at Niels's gallery and this guy comes in and he's wearing flip-flops and OP shorts, OP shorts and a t-shirt and um, he and his wife come in and, and she was very dressed down as well and we started talking, started talking and by the time the afternoon was done I had sold them $50,000 worth of art and he was a CEO of a giant corporation and was in town because he had to get his Ferrari fixed and the only Ferrari dealer was in Dairy no. Lake House. Yeah, where, yeah. where did he live? Where did uh, he, he lived in Rancho Mirage and I, th I think he's in um, Hawaii now. I and, love that. Uh, and, you know, and I, I remember Niels at that point was like, what are you, why are you talking to that guy? You know? and, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, as it started going, you know, he came in and we, we, we made a great sale and it was a great afternoon. So you never, especially in this town, you really never know. I mean, the rule is, oh, what, you know, what kind of watch are they wearing? That's usually a did giveaway and how big are the diamonds? But you know, Los Angeles is a very, like I said, it's, it's a meritocracy. You can't judge somebody by what they're wearing that day because who knows? Would who you they think were. I was a buyer if I walked into your space? I would think that, um, I, I don't know if I, if I would think of you as a buyer, but I would think of you as somebody who's engaging and engaged and who's interested. And because of that, 
I would spend as much time as I possibly could. Oh, with you. thank you. Well, I came to your gallery last week not knowing anything about it. Tell us about it. Where does the word come from? Pharmaca is a, it's, pharmaca is obviously the root for pharmacy. In fact, we still have people coming in looking around for, you know, Tylenol. <laughs> Drugs. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, pharmaca is an archaic Greek word. It's still a modern Greek word, but its archaic root is uh, twofold. Um, the really interesting part of it is that it means uh, two things at once, which is one a, uh, a, a poison or the other a remedy. And I, I love the fact that for contemporary art that it really is, you know, one man's poison is another man's um, treasure. Um, and in addition to that, it also referred to an artist's palate. So just like if you would think of an apothecary who is grinding up his chemicals to make um, a, a poultice or something, you would have a, an artist who would be grinding up their pigments to make paint to then paint with. So uh, Pharmaca as a gallery, as a nonprofit gallery, started off with the stated goal of investigating the role of contemporary, of, of painting in contemporary art and contemporary society. And, and how did you get involved? Um, I got involved through a few, uh, several artists that I, I now represent who I, I think were conspiring on the side. And I think that they were looking, uh, we've had a long relationship uh, over the years. I've always admired their work. And uh, if I remember correctly, the story was that they ran into each other at a Christmas party and they were talking and t were like, you know, how can we get Adam more involved in what we do? And we started off having artist art salons and these group of painters would get together. First it was two, then it was four, then it was 16. And uh, next thing you know, we did some great shows. We got offered a space in downtown Los Angeles. Where are you, on 5th and Main? We're on the corner of 5th and Main, which has now become the heart of the downtown gallery district. And, and you've been there less than a year? We've been there, I'd say, about six months. We've been open about six months. Here are some pictures. Tell us about these. Oh, this is work by Shane Gafog, who's um, a, I, 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 hard to typify him as to sort of what level of career he is. I'd say more mid-career artist. Um, he actually started off um, a, as a farm boy from a, a central California uh, town and came to Art Center and from there ended up working with uh, Ed Ruscha as a studio assistant for about 10 years. Um, Shane is very, very interested in, as you can see in his work, the, the play of light and shadow. But are these on canvas? These are mostly on canvas. You saw a couple of, oh, of watercolors in there as well. And, um, you know, very interested oddly enough by people like uh, as disparate as Rothko and Rembrandt. Um, also, there's a little bit of Pollock in there as well. When He's, you say mid-career, do you mean work that sells for over $3,000? Yes, yes. I mean, his canvases range everywhere from, uh, you know, 4000 to 25000 um, This is work by John Skane, who is also an abstract painter. I, I tend to have a, a taste for abstraction. Um, worked with, uh, worked at Cal State Long Beach, which is where he got his degree, and is somebody who's very, very interested or very focused on abstraction. The work you're seeing now is actually from a very interesting series of his called The Wall Series, where um, in his travels he would see, uh, he, what he became most fascinated with were the, the textures of the walls of the Louvre or of the, um, of the, the, the walls in Beijing that really told a story and told a history. And then there's a sort of the joke there of the fact that you're taking a painting of a wall and putting it on a wall, which typically art is meant to cover your wall, not to sort of bring attention to the flatness of it. But in that respect, I think he is, he has a bit of a traditional modernist in him in, in that respect. And that the, it's the thing that I enjoyed the most in your gallery was um, the, the glass. Mm. Tell me about that. Wasn't he a, a, a protege or a teacher of uh, the man in Seattle? Well, um, Dale Chihuly, who yeah. you're speaking of. Uh, Pino Signoretto is, uh, we're, to give you a little backstory, Pharmaca right now has a show up called Venice to Venice. The idea for Venice to Venice was to um, put together contemporary artists in Los Angeles and Venice, California, and merge and, and place them with uh, artists and painters in Venice, Italy. And in addition to that, put glass blowers in Venice, Italy together with contemporary artists. The, the whole goal here is to foment a bit of artistic exchange, and really more importantly, I think is to reinvigorate the art of glass making in Murano, which sadly enough, I don't want to call it a dying art right now, but there are certainly um, economic and socio factors that are really... It's probably the kids don't want to go through all of that tedious learning. Well, it's the learning and it's the fact of the matter is that making glasses, it's, um, it's, it's, there's a sense of the artisan in there. It is 
uh, it's hot. You know, you're, look, you're sitting over a 1500 degree pot of molten glass and it's, uh, you're in Venice in the canals. It's, you know, it's, it's hard work. It's a lot of, of heavy lifting. And quite frankly, for a lot of those kids, they'd rather either manage their father's business or their family's business or go to Milan and sit in the AC and, you know, wear a suit. It seems a lot easier and a lot cleaner. <laughs> and I don't blame them for that, but there really is, especially in glass, there's, a, there's like a magic to it. You know, it's this molten mass that somehow gets teased and shaped and prodded and pulled. Um, so what we did is we put several of our, so a few artists that I work with together with Pino Signoretto. Pino um, is recognized as probably one of the most important glass masters still working in Venice. There's, there's one other How guy. Old is he? He's in his early 60s. There's one other guy named, uh, I think it's Alfredo Barbini. He's in his 90s now and um, he still goes into the studio every day but just due to the, you know, his hands and everything's not working quite as well, I, I, we really wanted somebody who was going to have a little more uh, vigor to him. Um, Pino is known for doing his large-scale large scale glass works. In fact, he's, I think, one of the only people who can do a, a 10-foot tall sculpture in glass. And because of that, he has done a lot of work with Dale Chihuly on a lot of their large-scale pieces. How did Dale lose his eye? I, you know, that's a story I don't know. I know that the reason he doesn't work in glass anymore is because he had a, a pretty bad accident. I think that injured one of his arms. Um, so, you know, he's a man that has great vision and that is, uh, he's fortunate enough to surround himself with very talented people who can execute that vision. And, and that's a bit of the paradigm that we were trying to recreate here by taking artists like Shane Gafog and matching him then with Pino. Um, you know, Pino saw one of Shane's paintings, one of those, uh, they call them the ribbon paintings, uh, at a show in Venice, Italy, and was absolutely blown away and pulled Shane aside and said, I, I have no idea how I can make this. I don't even know if I can, but I want to try, and I want you to be there along with me for this. So um, it's been a very interesting voyage in that regard, and it's a, something that we want to continue doing um, for the, at least the next several years and to try to pair more artists with more glass blowers and see what we can come up with. Have you ever tried blowing glass yourself? Never, although I, uh, one of my not just my fondest memories, but I do have a great memory of when I would go to Disneyland as a kid and, and they would have the guy who would be doing the lamp work, which yeah, is when they yeah, make the little yeah. horses and stuff. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I, I couldn't, it was magic. And um, it's even more magic when you see somebody dip into a pot of hot red molten glass and pull their pigments out and roll it in, in gold and, and to tease it into this shape that becomes something completely unique. It's really, um, it's really inspiring. And, and you know, back to the, the things that are buffeting the Marinese glass industry, a little uh, side note is that if you go to Murano or you go to Venice, as you know, they, you, they, you would see little um, pieces of, of glass candy, right? Yeah, and exactly. you, you yeah. buy them. What those used to be was that at the end of the day, the studio assistants would sit down and as a way of making some extra pocket money, would take some of the extra glass and they would just twist them up and make some easy candy and, and send them on out. Well, a few years ago, somebody came up with the genius idea of outsourcing that and realized that it's way cheaper to have them made in China than to have them actually made in <laughs> Murano. So now when you go to Murano or go to Venice and you are buying those little candies, more often than not, they were made by some nameless guy in China and you're buying them thinking that you're buying Marini's glass. So, I mean, that's, Molly, something very important to me is the idea of craftsmanship and the idea of the artisan and the artist's hand in what they do. And Does the computer interfere with that? I don't think so. I think it's just another tool. I mean, I, I uh, I mean, p p artists, I think, are, people originally had looked down upon the idea of printmaking as, as fine exactly, art. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, people like uh, Tyler Graphics and Gemini Gel have, I think, solidly proved them wrong. And as a tool, I think that, um, that the computer as a tool used in art making is very effective. In fact, next door to the Pharmaca Gallery, there's the Los Angeles Center for Digital Art, who focuses exclusively on I was shocked that. to see two of my friends showing there. Really? Michael Wright and Victor Acevedo. Yeah, they yeah. Have, they've got a very nice, um, uh, very egalitarian and open oh, it's technique. Okay, who is the third artist that really interested me in your, in your show was uh, somebody who does noses blowing up, kind of almost cartoon work. Mm -hmm. That's the work of Vaughn Sumner. Um, Von Cumming Sumner, as he is known in the art world, Von to me. Um, but he is a relatively young artist in his late 20s and studied with Wayne Thiebaud in San Francisco oh, at Davis. Oh, that's why. Yeah, that's why I love it so much. Well, and, and I think that what you're seeing in there as well, and what, at least what you're admiring, is the, the skill with which he paints and the quality with which this is work by Von Sumner that you're seeing on uh, the screen right now. Um, there's, a, there's a sense of the absurd in there. Um, that's a portrait of his wife. Um, there's something else to point out is that not only does he freehand all oh, that pattern in the yeah. background, but he also creates all those props. So that hat that his father is wearing there 
is a hat that he created and his father stood there and posed for that portrait. Um, the, the hat that he's wearing on the far left side there was something that he saw I think it was in a 15th century fresco in Italy and it, it was somebody wearing that exact hat and he thought, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life and I've got to go home and do something and do with it. that. Yeah. Um, so Vaughn, I think, I, I, I think Vaughn's onto something in that he merges a very, um, a great respect for the art. Um, he's somebody who studied with a renowned and recognized master of painting um, and also of pop art. So he brings a, a bit of that pop sensibility to it, but he also brings a certain, and I think this is what makes pop a fun thing in the first place, is that there's a certain sort of insouciance. It's, it's uh, you know, pop used to be called, um, you know, art of, the art of everybody. Uh, art, what was it, the first show that Walter Hopps did? The, Art of Everyday Objects or something. I forgot the title of it. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of absurd to see a soup can on a canvas. Uh, but I think that what Vaughn brings to it is a, a sense, as I said, a sense of craftsmanship and uh, a certain amount of recognizing the absurdity of it. I mean, for God's sakes, that was a painting of Vaughn wearing a, a paper bag over his head with like 30 cigarettes stuck into yeah, it. Perfect. So, I mean, that's, uh, you can't get more absurd than that, I feel. But uh, in, in that, I think people really respond to that. Um, those, uh, the, the, the long noses that he did uh, were, I think, partly inspired by the Comedia dell'Arte, yeah, and that's about yeah. the Venice to Venice collaboration, but um, it was also something that he came up, um, up with on his own. So he is somebody who studiously tries to not talk about his art and to let the viewer infuse it with their own meaning. Lawrence Holloway came up with the name Pop Art, but I don't know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, well the, the first show of Pop Art, if I remember correctly, was with Walter Hopps. He did the show at the Pasadena Museum, and I think it was Art of Common Objects or something like that was the title. And it was, and Alloway, I think the year later, did that, uh, I don't know if it was a show or a, uh, an article or a book that he wrote, um, where he referred to it as Pop Sunshine Art. Sunshine Muse, Peter Blagans wrote it. Yeah. Uh, what, if you could own one piece of art, what would it be? Yeah. Oddly enough, and I, I, I don't know, I think... Better say it fast. All right. I, I would say it, it, would, it would be a Mark Rothko painting. And really? Yeah. Why? Because uh, a couple of reasons. First, just the quiet power of those paintings. And you can't see it, but I have the chills thinking about just being in the presence of those paintings. They, they, they vibrate somehow. They, they have a life to them, so, to them. And in addition to that, there was something about the, the insistence of Rothko the, 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 the pure care that he used in both making his work and in the placement of it and, um, you know, the stories of you wouldn't pick a Rothko, Rothko would pick a Rothko for you, you know, right, um, right. And, or sitting in a gallery all day to watch the way the light moves so that yeah. he could get everything in the right place. And, and I, I, I like to see art that is made with a certain respect. I, I want to feel like the artist approached his work with respect and that I therefore can approach it with that same kind Thank of respect. Thank you, Adam. It was just a treat talking to you. Oh, it was a you. pleasure. I can't I, believe I, that our time's up so I fast. I suggest to everyone that you go down and see Adam Gross. And uh, Fifth again, and Main at Pharmaca. Art is not for everyone. It never has been. It never will be. But for those of you who love it like we do, we want to turn you on. I'm Molly Barnes. Thanks for watching.